Thanks very much, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. I couldn't find a more appropriate group of people to discuss the impact of uh, PET in personalized medicine. I truly believe, and hopefully I will convince you by the time I finish my talk that this is going to be the centerpiece of personalized medicine, either in developing drugs, research in many settings, and for sure in day-to-day -day practice of medicine. What really has changed imaging dramatically over the past 40 years has been the concept of a glucose analog called deoxyglucose. Uh, this concept came from our group at Penn in collaboration with colleagues at NIH that really we can just look at glucose metabolism being the most important molecule in our body and now having the capability of labeling it with something that we can see from the outside and therefore image its distribution in the rest of the body. Although this is of course one of thousands of compounds that either have been labeled or will be labeled in the future, but this has just dramatically shown the importance of looking at molecules. As I've heard all day today about early health disease starts and as such, early demonstrating what's going on in our body in a non-invasive, quantitative, and in a very effective manner. This concept, it started in 1973 by three colleagues at Penn, myself, David Kuhl, who was my mentor at the time, a neurologist named Rybich, in collaboration with colleagues at the Brookhaven National Laboratory in the middle of Long Island, who had the capability of labeling fluorine 18, which is a positron emitter, and, and those days, the places that had cyclotrons to make positrons were very limited. And this eventually led to making this label for deoxyglucose, and, and of course, start in a beginning, as I will show you, in molecular imaging. Of course, glucose, as I mentioned earlier, is a very, very important molecule for viability of the cell. It goes through the transporters, phosphorylates to the glucose 6-phosphate, biexokinase, and of course, in normal uh, glucose metabolic pad, it may go in different directions. And FDG pretty much mimics what glucose does in the cell and therefore, we can just look at dynamics of glucose going through the cells. And a very important part of that I will come back to during my talk is the importance of glucose 6-phosphatase, which breaks down glucose 6-phosphate or FTG 6-phosphate. And after glucose or FTG being used once has to leave the cell. So it, this allows us to look at a biochemistry of this very important molecule in the, in the body. So, the images, of course, that we obtained very early on in 1976 was not as impressive as structural imaging that looks at the details of structure in a gross manner, like autopsy slice of brain or CT or MRI, but this was a very important day in my personal life by showing that we were able to fool the brain and take in FTG instead of glucose and giving us the image of glucose metabolism in the cortex or subcortical areas. Also, I just looked at the subject who at the time was willing to spend an hour in the machine and did this whole body image. And this was the beginning of whole body imaging, which is the common way that we look at FTG in cancer, which has been discussed extensively today. Why do we want to go to something that looks at function versus structure, especially the beautiful images that we get today with MRI. The answers are very clear. Structural imaging with the best methodology that we have today, which is MRI, is very, very insensitive. 99% of the disease will be hidden from structural imaging when it starts. So disease starts on the molecular level, and therefore, we have to find a way that can see the disease in the molecular level in a sensitive manner. It's the major deficiency of the structural imaging. Similarly, we want to treat our patients and see the effects of treatment as best as possible. We, of course, hear today that drugs don't work all the time, unfortunately, and there's individual variation, and not knowing that disease is effective or not 
waiting for three, four, five months to see that structural imaging is a wasted time and effort suffering for the patient cost to the society. Similarly, structural imaging is quite non-specific, so you're going to subject a lot of people to invasive procedure, costly procedure, dangerous procedures because of the abnormality that you see on CT or MRI scan. For all these reasons, of course, PET had to come to help, which it has, and has overcome many of these shortcomings, as I will describe to you shortly. One very important aspect of PET for scientists like myself has been the feasibility of labeling biologically important compounds, either man-made in our body or in animal body, or uh, or human made, or made it outside with elements such as carbon, fluorine 18, iodine, variety of metals. So it has opened up the enormous possibilities for us as scientists to look at the body in health and disease. Also, we have much better details seen with PET than conventional functional imaging techniques, including MR, and we target the A that we are interested in, known what we know from the cell level, from the pharmacologist, molecular biologist, we know exactly what we have to do to target a particular preparation to go to the site and nowhere else. And this improves the sensitivity of our technique and seeing much more readily disease process anywhere in the body. And of course, we can do fast imaging. And above all, the future of imaging is going to be quantification, and PET is the most quantitative technique that we have today. Now, coincidence of PET with the introduction of MR was a tragic episode in science because everybody looked at those beautiful images that were primarily based on water content on MR and assumed that they're going to be contrast agents with gadolinium, iron, and so forth and so on. And fortunately for PET, that did not happen, but unfortunately delayed development of PET far beyond what we had imagined. There's a thousand times difference in sensitivity between the two technologies and maybe even 10,000 times. So we can give very toxic agents uh, as a tracer with pet labeled compounds and therefore have no side effect whatsoever and, and determine their fate in the body. In the past 10 years or so, we have seen, of course, combination of PET and CT. And of course, soon PET MRI is going to be on the scene. So we will have best of both worlds, but the structure is primarily to guide us where the lesions are on PET images. The images, as I said, are high contrast, so patient with a normal, so multiple lesions anywhere in the body with one image that it takes about 15, 20 minutes. You can see the extent of the disease. Many of these lesions will be either missed or overdiagnosed by CT or MRI. One thing that, of course, is going to disappear is structural imaging alone for managing patients in a patient with GIST tumor, waiting two, three months to see lesions are disappearing due to GLEVAC, or of course seeing more lesions are moving to GLEVAC, is going to be replaced by PET-CT, where we will be able to see breakdown in the chemistry of the cells, just overnight, within 24 to 40 hours, if you give GLEVAC to a patient that's got GIST tumor, you're going to see all the lesions losing their glucose metabolism and continue giving it. If you don't give glee back and give something else, you will see, of course, the same thing as baseline and move to you know, a glee back, or, of course, not to give the right drug and see more lesions and then switch to glee back. These are just dramatic images of a patient with lymphoma where we see disappearance of the lesions within two months, while it will take at least three to four or five months to see on the CT scan. In radiation oncology, we have completely replaced CT alone because over-treating and under-treating patients with cancer. This is an example of a patient with lung cancer that even best radiologists thought the entire area was cancer, while PET shows only half of the area is cancerous. Therefore, you can minimize the radiation to adjacent lung by only radiating the lesion that is active and not the normal lung. One thing that I heard, of course, this morning about inhomogeneity of cancer, 
And we effectively shown that cancer in the same body, depending on where it is in any of the organs, this lung cancer data that we have published, shown that the dynamics of FDG over time is completely different, meaning that cancer is just constantly changing its genetics as it moves from one side to the other. And again, this is showing us why we have not been able to cure cancer and we can individualize based on PET images. Uh, these are our data from breast cancer, showing that not all breast cancers are the same. Estrogen progesterone positive tumors have very low metabolism, change very little from one image to the other. These we have done over like an hour or two. In contrast to triple negative lesions have got significantly more metabolism and change very significantly over time. So really, again, we can just show who really should be treated more actively than the others. We can look at the entire lesions in the body quantitatively and, and give one number to the clinician, which again is going to be only possible with PET. This takes into account both volume and activity of the disease. Of course, there's life beyond FDG. We can look at DNA. It's been a great deal of discussion about genetics and DNA. So, it, of course, all sorts of traces can be labeled with PET elements in the future. This is just looking at cell proliferation with thymidine compounds. I just want to mention before I just end my talk that really colleagues in industry should talk to people really who are familiar with the, the potential of these technologies. And of course, one of the areas that we have been very critical of looking at amyloid uh, plaques, it's very difficult to see amyloid plaques because they're very few in numbers and you have to have like 10,000 10, times more than background in these plaques to be able to see. Because I mean, this is just the data from PEV, which is an amyloid agent. It looks identical to FDG, which of course should be the reverse. So you know, this is the type of thing I like to see disappear in the future by the industry and consult people who really know what PET can do, what cannot do. This is just distribution of amyloid, which is primarily in part of temporal area. Now. Um, the same has happened with FYU for looking at infection. Unfortunately, a lot of money has been spent in these areas and say areas that they cannot do now. There's ongoing trials in diabetes. Again, very difficult to be able to see islets in the pancreas because of the, you know, the poor resolution of the PET. So in the overall, uh, we have some difficulties and some strengths that we have to be aware of, but overall, PET, especially PET CT and PET MRI in the future, has substantially improved our ability to personalize uh, uh, these uh, treatments and investigation in, in human beings. And this is a minimizing suffering and pain. And also, it's going to substantially reduce the cost of healthcare in the future. Thank you.